Good morning. Christ is in our midst. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's very natural to wonder what happens to us after we die. And beyond being in God's presence, being in heaven, kind of, how does it all work? What happens? What are the specifics that happen? And sometimes people use this parable of uh, Lazarus and the rich man to try to explain what happens after we die, because there's a little geography given here. There's, there's heaven, there's Hades, where the rich man ends up. There's this great chasm that the two can't communicate, and, and it gets a little bit specific in this parable. But what we need to remember is this is not a parable describing geography, not even spiritual geography. Jesus is not giving a theology class on what happens immediately after death. This is called an apocalyptic parable. An apocalyptic parable is a parable that gives us a warning. There's other ones that we've heard. The parable of the faithful servant, where the servant had to be faithful while the master was away and he was going to come back at some time that the Lord, that he did not know. There's the parable of the wise and the foolish bridesmaids. Five of them were prepared and five of them were not prepared. It was a warning to be prepared. There's the parable of the rich man who put all his prophets into his land, and he didn't care for those who were in need. Today, too, is a warning parable. It's a message that judgment will sometimes, in the future, be coming. And we are called to be ready. During his life, the rich man did not see Lazarus, even though Lazarus was at his very gate. And now he sees him at a great distance, but it's too late. During his life, the rich man enjoyed lavish meals, and Lazarus had nothing but the dogs licking his sores. And now this is reversed. Lazarus was in poverty in life, and now it is reversed with him being in the bosom of Abraham. So the purpose of this parable is to give all of us a warning. Oftentimes, in parables, we kind of try to identify with someone in the parable. But rather than identify with the rich man, or Lazarus, the poor man, the calling for us in this parable is to identify with the brothers of the rich man. The rich man says to Abraham, tell my brothers about all of this, so they don't have to go through what I'm going through. And he said, uh, no, they have Moses, they have the prophets. Well, maybe if someone rises from the dead and tells them, and Abraham says, well, you know, even if someone rises from the dead, they probably won't listen. So we are in the position of the brothers. We have been given the warning. We actually have had someone 
rise from the dead and tell us our Lord Jesus Christ? And will we listen? Will we heed the warning? Will we recognize what is important in life? I think this is an important statement for us. Focusing on what is important in life. And I do think that as a culture, as a society, we have gotten off the mark. As you know, the Dodgers and the Yankees just finished the World Series. And not that I am either for the Dodgers or the Yankees, although I am from Boston, a Red Sox fan, so that might give you a hint. But one of the things that happened in, that, in, in one of the games was a ball was hit into the outfield, and one of the players rushed to the wall to catch the ball. He jumped up. The ball went into his glove. He was right against the wall. And a fan who was in the stands, and was right there too because he was against the wall, grabbed the player's hand and his glove and thought to himself, I'm going to get the ball. A World Series ball, won't that be nice? And maybe I'll even get the glove, too. And the friend of this player in the stands, of the fan in the stands, the friend grabbed the player's other hand. So the player is there with one hand in the glove being held, and another hand being held by someone else. And there were pictures in the news about it. Obviously, this is something, you know, kind of a, a big deal, at least in baseball and sports and all. doesn't happen every day. The thing is, I don't think something like that has ever happened. I don't think people have been doing these things before. I think people are doing things nowadays that they never did before. And that this little silly thing, which is kind of funny in a way, but isn't all that funny if it's a symptom of where we've come. The two fans were thrown out of the game, and their punishment was they couldn't come to any more World Series games. And people were either cheering them or booing them. I guess depending on if they were a Dodgers fan or a Yankee fan. And it seems like that's how it is today. People are either booing or cheering, defending if, depending on if you are benefiting or not. And this is problematic. As you know also, in a couple of days is the election for president, and uh, many of you have already voted, and some are about to vote, and hoping in whoever wins that this will be a wonderful thing, that this will, this will solve many problems, that this will usher in a new era of wonder and goodness. But we have to remember a couple things. Firstly, our trust is in God. Our trust is not in any human person. Never. Human people disappoint because human people are human. And we have to be very careful about where we put our trust. I'm not saying we shouldn't vote. I'm just saying that Choose the person you believe is the right person. But don't believe that this person is the answer. 
and thus eventually be disappointed. And secondly, that God will use anybody for his purposes. So whoever wins, God can use that person. Even if it's a person that we don't think God would use. God can use whoever. Remember in Matthew's Gospel, when Jesus was born, Herod the king was going to king kill all the children in Bethlehem because he didn't want any potential kings to rise up. So Joseph was warned in a dream to get out of town. And he fled to Egypt. And the bad king actually did do bad things and killed the children in Bethlehem, two years old and younger. And then, in Egypt, Joseph has another dream. He says, the dream told him, the angel told him in the dream that Herod the king who was after your child is now dead. You can return home. So they head back up, and there was a new king. New king, hopefully, is going to be better than the last king. And then they get another warning dream. Don't go back to Bethlehem because it's the son of uh, the former king, and he's just as bad. So they end up going to Nazareth. It's interesting, I find, that none of the kings were good at that time, and they weren't much better when Jesus grew up. But it did not stop God's work from working. God never said, oh shucks, I don't have a good king there. I'll have to put all this, this, uh, this uh, salvation on hold until we get someone good in there. You know, whoever gets in does not thwart God's purpose. For us, we have to be focused on God's purpose. We have to be thinking in this idea of the parable today. What is the warning to us? Choose who you think is the best person. But more importantly is, what is the warning to us? How should I behave in this life? How should I treat those around me? There's no warning in the Bible about who you should vote for, but there are plenty of warnings about how one should act in this life. So let's be honorable people. Let's be loving people. Let's be uh, united people, united first and foremost by our faith. The Lord loves us and he calls us to goodness. And whatever happens this week, it'll be fine. Our job is, has a bigger purpose to serve the Lord and to serve each other by following the Lord's commandments. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is in our midst. I'd like the children to come up front.